to us. Um, all right, so um, welcome everyone to the um, first uh, meeting of the National Advisory Group for the Media Smart Libraries Project. My name is Renee Hobbs, and we're really delighted that you've agreed to join us for about the next uh, 60 minutes or so, maybe a little bit longer. Help us um, plan what we think is going to be um, a bit of a game-changing um, project that we hope you'll be able to um, help us develop over the next couple of years. Um, what we're going to do today in the next hour is we're going to give we're going to spend about 10 minutes talking with you about the project and uh, identifying the program goals, sharing a little bit of the work we've done so far, um, and then sketching a, a little bit of an outline for what we're imagining uh, the program will be like. Get your feedback on on that and uh, your sense of possibility about other elements or uh, other directions that this initiative can take. Um, and then really drill down on some of the questions that we're working on now. Uh, the, the Media Smart Libraries Project is a, um, it's a planning grant from the Institute of Library and uh, Museum and Library Studies uh, that's designed to address a, um, a challenge that I first identified two years ago when I came to the Harrington School of Communication and Media at the University of Rhode Island, started um, working closely with the school and public librarians in uh, the state of Rhode Island um, and discovered really that um, the, uh, a, a, a significant number of uh, school and public librarians uh, did not feel um, tuned in to the um, powerful way in which um, children's uh, children film uh, can be used as a literacy tool uh, we're not familiar with the work of youth media uh, 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 initiatives going on here in the state of Rhode Island. Um, and and in, in some ways, just, uh, simply felt out of the loop on uh, resources for children and young people that were, well, as librarians sometimes say, non-print media. And um, we we started uh, we we also discovered that we have a really robust cultural treasure here in uh, Rhode Island, the Providence Children's Film Festival, which is an annual event now in its I think sixth or seventh, fifth or sixth year, uh, where every February uh, you know a really terrific uh, ten day program of uh, children's films uh, from all over the world are screened. Um, at a variety of different venues here in the Providence area. So we started thinking about what we might do to um, really bring together um, children's media professionals, uh, youth media and media literacy advocates, school and public librarians working in children and youth, children's library and youth service, um, and educators working in the K-12 uh, environment. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about the program goals, and I'll see if I can get the screen share function to work. You, my apologies if I can't quite get it to work, but let's just see what I can do here. If I share my screen to show you my slides, what do you see? What do you see? We see your whole yeah. desktop. You see my whole desktop. That's with the slide. Um, okay, hold on here. Don't, uh, ah! Ah! <laughs> uh, I might have, I might have uh, made a big mistake here. Let's see what I did. Um, uh, there we go. Now, now, what can you see? Can you see my whole screen now? No. No. No, we still see you. Yeah. You still see me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see what I can do here. Um, go back to this. Let's try it one more time, huh? Screen share. And Media Smart Libraries start screen share. Now, what do you okay. see? Now we see. Well, did. Now do you see a slide that says Media Smart Libraries? Yes. 
Yes. yes, but we we still see your whole desktop as well. You do. Bizarre. But it's visible. All right, I don't oh, really know. But the slides are advancing now, so that's the good. The slides are advancing. Woo yeah. So I think it's, it still works. It still yeah. works. Okay, good. So take a look at these three program goals. Our first goal is to try to uh, uh, ensure that uh, children's and youth service librarians, educators, parents, uh, and really everyone who works with children and youth are using film and media to promote literacy for a digital age. We're part of that group of um, hopeful idealists who want the word literacy uh, to mean sharing meaning through all forms of symbolic expression, whether that be uh, visual, sound, digital, or media. Um, the second goal that we have is we want to build collaborative capacity among librarians, educators, and children's media professionals. Um, that's partly because we've discovered, at least here in Rhode Island, it's a pretty siloed up world where uh, the K-12 educators are too busy to intersect with the public librarians. Uh, the public librarians are too busy to connect to the children's media professionals, and the children's media professionals really don't know how to interact with the uh, librarians or educators in their communities very well. Um, and the final goal that we have uh, is it says support innovation in LIS education, library and information studies. Um, what we want to do is try to see if we can use this opportunity as a way to reinvent LIS education, especially for those librarians who plan to go into children's libraries or youth serving youth service programs so that we, um, before they get to be a librarian, we introduce them to some of the powerful um, uh, resources that are available with children's media, with um, media literacy, with youth media, uh, and with technology uh, more, more broadly. So our first path in uh, on this initiative was to do a needs assessment. And we had the opportunity to do some deep dive interviews and some survey research with um, public librarians in, um, who, are, who are responsible for children's library service in the state of Rhode Island and school library media specialists in Rhode Island. And all of them indicated, almost all of them indicated uh, a lack of knowledge about children's media that was non-print. Um, and uh, a quite an interest in using film more effectively, in using digital media effectively, in um, supporting children's creative media production. A lot of interest from the library community, but right now not a lot of capacity. So we're hoping to design a robust, exciting initiative that will have a national level component and a statewide component. Take a look at what we're uh, imagining right now. We're imagining doing something at the 2015 Providence Children's Film Festival to sort of kick off a program called Media Smart Libraries. And we then imagine some kind of statewide series of film and media literacy programs. Some perhaps in school libraries, some perhaps in public libraries, some perhaps um, in other uh, public events. Um, but we want to sort of fertilize the state with a variety of different kinds of programs. And bullet point number three is pretty important too. We want to, we have two required courses that all uh, students who are school and public librarians have to take in our, at our program at the Harrington School. We want to reinvent those two courses so that there's a deep experiential learning uh, dimension where those students actually get a deep dive opportunity working in a school or public library uh, as part of their coursework where they get to do some uh, film activities and some media literacy activities or some youth media activities. Step four, we then imagine a national symposium in 2016 that really brings together the uh, li the children's library, the youth serving library, with the children's media professionals, the technology integration folks in K-12, 
and the uh, media literacy and youth media folks. So we're really imagining kind of a, a larger national sharing. And we know, of course, we're going to need some kind of online resources that pull all these uh, program elements together. So um, that's, in a nutshell, what we're imagining for the program. Uh, Joe just joined our call, so just to say hi to Joe. Hey, hi, sorry Joe. about that. No, oh, yeah, hi, sorry. Not, not to worry. We just did a little overview of the Media Smart Libraries program, and now we're really ready for our discussion. So okay. what I'd like to do is ask each of you to introduce yourselves uh, to us briefly so we can understand the uh, talent and the resources that, we're, that are joining us here today. Uh, Brian, can you go first? Will you introduce yourself to us? Sure. Um, I'm Brian Ferling. I am a director of education technology at Catherine Cook School in Chicago. It's an independent school. Um, uh, and it's a it serves uh, children pre-K through eighth grade. And I am a former teacher in the Chicago Public Schools. I taught preschool, and I'm a national board certified teacher. Um, went to Erickson, uh, so I have a degree in early childhood education, and. Uh, wrote a book called Teaching in the Digital Age and a variety of items that support that book as well. Um, working on a contribution to a book that Chip Donnie was editing. So it's, it's about looking at uh, you know children's <clears throat> development and, and digital media and technology and emerging technologies and how those can play a role in education. Um, that's, that's in a nutshell. <clears throat> Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Deb O'Bear, will you introduce yourself to us? Sure. Hi, I'm Deborah O'Bear Thomas. I um, formerly worked at the National Office of Girls Incorporated, where I developed their Girls Inc. Media Literacy Program, um, which ranged uh, across ages from six to eighteen. And the, the teenage um, component was a, also included a digital video production workshop. Um, I'm currently living in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, beginning actually in next year, in January, I will be working with an organization called Fresh Eye Media. They're out of California, but I'll be working to bring their programs here to Columbus, Ohio. I'm also a former member of the um, NAMLA board, which was AMLA. Wait, I always get confused. Which <laughs> the NAMLA now and was AMLA then. Um, and so happy to be involved. Nice. Thank you so much. Uh, Joe, will you introduce yourself to us? Sure. Uh, my name is Joe Dulet. I am the Teen New Media Program Manager at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. I've been running this program for about 11 years. It's an after-school and out-of-school time program for teens, uh, primarily in Boston Public Schools. Um, we run a credit program with the Boston Public Schools as well, so students can get credit taking classes here at the museum. Um, we run classes in DJing and photography and uh, advanced filmmaking and fashion design, graphic design, along with artist residencies with all the artists who come through the ICA on exhibition. Now, prior to my work here, I worked at the Community Arts Center and ran the Do It Your Damn Self National Youth Film and Video Festival. We love that. We love that festival. We're so glad you're joining us today. Katie, can you introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Katie Donnelly. I have worked on a variety of national media literacy initiatives over the past seven or eight years. And along with Renee, I wrote this planning grant to the IMLS that is allowing us to do this brainstorming for a bigger project. Wonderful. Uh, Morgan, can you introduce yourself to us? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Morgan Jaffe. I'm a research assistant um, with Renee and Katie working on the grant. Uh, I just graduated from the University of uh, Rochester with my master's uh, this past May in digital media and adolescent literacy. So, hi. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Nicole, can you introduce yourself to us? Sure. I'm Nicole Benichel Hewitt. I'm executive director of Children's Media Project, um, which is a media literacy and production education center. We do after school and in school programs and we do a youth film festival and we're also working with a lot of area libraries. Um, in fact, we just got another contract to work to create a mobile media lab. So I'd love to talk to, about that because we'll be having um, laptops and digital tools that we'll be able to kind of cart around to all the Hudson Valley libraries. I'm in the Hudson Valley of New York. That's cool. <clears throat> Fantastic. Uh, and, and I'm Renee Hobbs. I, I teach at the Harrington School and uh, uh, direct the Media Education Lab. 
Uh, one of the reasons why we're excited about your joining us as members of the National Advisory Board is that our local advisory board is mostly school uh, librarians and uh, children's librarians, and we realized that for this project to be successful, we needed the insight and wisdom and expertise of folks um, working in the children's media sector uh, with experts like, um, like you to help us imagine how this might be a model for what could happen in other states. So certainly we want uh, the, the uh, children, young people, parents, uh, and citizens of Rhode Island to benefit from this project. But we're also seeing what we can do to explore the university, library, children's media partnership opportunity to really expand our abilities to collaborate across the university, the nonprofit sector, and, the, and the, the government, the library sector. So your insight and wisdom will really be helpful to us as we try to plan a program that um, might be useful, uh, some elements might be replicable or useful uh, gu uh, guidance or inspire um, folks in other uh, states. So, so that being said, uh, what we'd like to do is really move to the, um, the questions that we have um, uh, for, for you. Um, Really, the, um, the three questions have to do with the different program elements. We're wondering your thoughts on what kinds of um, local events would be uh, productive, helpful, powerful, um, that would um, address librarians' needs, as you have experienced that. We're interested in how our library students might gain knowledge and skills through some forms of experiential learning. And we want to get your ideas a little bit about what might we hope to accomplish if we were to hold a national symposium that brought together uh, children's librarians, uh, children's media professionals, and youth media experts. Um, so I guess we'll just open the floor uh, to your experiences and thoughts about um, how we might move forward uh, trying to increase the capacity for collaboration between um, librarians and uh, children's media professionals. Uh, Nicole, I'd love it if, to hear from you a little bit about your experience. Sure. Well, we've had a lot of um, experience with independent programs at different libraries throughout the Hudson Valley. Um, typically, a library approaches us and they want a short-term program, like, um, for example, we did a three-day movie-making experience. That gradually evolved so that the, the largest library in our area is the Poughkeepsie Library. They're kind of the center for the Mid-Hudson Library hub, and um, they started really enhancing the services that they offer youth in the area of media. So they they actually were already a step ahead because they had a teen media room that um, had mostly gaming units. When we got there we decided to start doing um, graphic design, filmmaking, web design, music production. So we kind of outlined our objectives together and we, we were successful getting an IMLS MacArthur grant to to really beef up their media lab, to get them the equipment and really the, the focus of it, it was a planning grant, so the whole focus of the year and a half planning period was professional development, getting them, you know, working with us to get them the right equipment because they didn't have the staff to understand what purchases to make. Um, and to engage the youth in the community on in the process of selecting and devising what programs will be available and then to pilot some of those programs. So we did all of that with them, um, which led to opening more doors and writing a regional economic development grant, which we were just told last week we've received to create the mobile media lab. So that's going to be our next step to start kind of shopping these programs around. Um, it's very different than our center. It's interesting because our center is just a few blocks away, and we do primarily filmmaking. And they were worried about being competition, but the the real distinction is their their center is more of a drop-in, hangout, do your own projects kind of center. It's actually um, have any of you heard the the um, acronym Hamago? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Um, Hamago hangout, mess around, geek geek out if I got it right. Um, 
So that's the kind of uh, lab that they've set up where kids can come in, they can hang out, they can mess around with the tools, and eventually they'll, on their own, kind of with, with somebody there to mentor them if they need it, get to the point where they are geeking out on this equipment. Um, in our space, it's a much more, um, the process is really led by our media mentor. So, so it's you know much more of a group process, and the expectations are different. The enrollment process is different. So there's a real distinction, but we found that there's lots of ways to work together. Um, to have our youth working with their youth, to have experts come in that can work with both uh, both our programs and their programs as teaching artists or as um, you know, coming in to do a special presentation to get their use to create media to submit to our film festivals. There's a lot of overlap. But I think it all started with um, really starting to build a relationship with their administration over there, their teen library coordinator. Um, her daughter was in our program and that's where it all began. That is a great, that, that's a great story. And it also helps me understand one of the things we were um, uh, curious about, which was how would our existing youth media programs feel about libraries stepping into the space? You're saying these programs weren't, you, it wasn't competitive, but it was in fact a kind of um, distinctive forms of uh, cooperation like an on-ramp. Um, yeah. I think, have, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I think it's, um, you know, Really, part of our mission is to extend the media arts as an educational tool into schools, into libraries, into you know anywhere where kids are learning. So you know, really, it's furthering our mission and the fact that we're getting to send our teaching artists over to do professional development and to to be part of those homago sessions in the lab. Um, when they get to a point where they want to advance beyond what they can do at the library, they come and enroll in one of our advanced sessions. So there is, you know, we've, we've found a way of, of not being competitors. That's so cool. Katie, will you do me a favor, uh, mute your microphone. Ah, yeah, that's good. That's better. Katie, are you hearing me? Can you mute your microphone? I guess. Oh yeah, she did. Okay, good, good, good. Um, Joe, what's your been your experience in the uh, working with libraries? Are are, libra are librarians and uh, youth and uh, youth serving teen librarians uh, uh, part of your uh, experience set? And what 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 have you learned about uh, about working in relation to uh, 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 the members of the library community? We actually, in the teen program, I don't have, surprisingly, I don't have a lot of relationships with librarians, although our, um, I do as a parent, because I have little kids, and so I have lots of time with uh, kind of children's room librarians, and our family programs um, manager has recently established kind of a visiting, like a tour to all the Boston, not all of them, but many of the Boston public libraries uh, um, to kind of establish a relationship <clears throat> similar to what Nicole was describing as a way to kind of bring our programming out to the community, kind of be that that content provider in the community. Um, you know, not necessarily just to bring them to the ICA because that's why we're going to the communities, but that's one of the ultimate goals is to introduce them to another community resource that's the larger community, which is that of Boston. And you know, mm -hmm. for the ICA, it's larger than Boston. And I think she's had a lot of success being, you know, bringing that, the libraries have really embraced it and have, have really seemed to, you know, desire this type of expert, you know, not that we're the, the expert in terms of how to interact with kids, because libraries do that really well, but in terms of, like, introducing contemporary art and art making in a way that they might not, you know, do that in their setting. So what we found is that families do seem to embrace this this opportunity at the library and then We've been trying to, to figure out ways to, see, to track how many of those families do come then to the ICAs. We have a pretty robust family program, and we see lots of families. But what we've seen is it's been hard to be consistent with getting families from the Boston communities. Oftentimes, it's families outside of the Boston communities in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. So this is our effort to do that. But we do run a movie making la um, a family movie making session here at the ICA, and we've talked about possibly you know, doing that in the in the library setting or even recruiting from that library setting. 
as a way to introduce our, our media component as well. And that family movie making class is definitely like a pathway towards our teen programming here as well, because we want families to know that there is a media, there's media education that's happening here in the arts. Um, it sounds pretty exciting. Can you tell us more about the family movie making and how it's structured and what makes that effective? Yeah, it's funny. The the woman that um, kind of has been running that, Lenora Simzak, um, who's the assistant to the teen program here, has said that what she does is she spends lots of time developing this great curriculum that asks the students to work. It's a it's for younger kids, so it's like you have to come with a parent and asking them to create a film that responds to one of the pieces or one of the uh, gallery shows. And then what ends up happening is they all just make whatever they want anyways, and they end up having a great time, and the movies are awesome. <laughs> um, we usually, you know, we're usually working, we have 12 computers in here, and we usually have about six families. Um, and that's often a parent and a couple of kids sitting at the computer. We give them all the, you know, the cameras and microphones and things and help them out. And I think it's like a three- or four-hour workshop, and they... they conceive, shoot, and edit that piece over the course of those three or four hours. And what program do you use to edit? They're using iMovie. We have iMovie, okay. we have Final Cut, and we have Adobe Premiere oh, in here. Cool. Most, of, most of the kids come in here with iMovie experience, so they're, that part we don't have to teach them. It's really, In fact, what Lenora realizes is they don't have to teach them anything. What it, what it really fosters is this moment where the kids and the parents are creating together, and the rest mm -hmm. of it, they all seem to come with those skills. So mm -hmm. it really is a moment where the families are making art together and that's something that doesn't often happen because the kids are either making it in school or in some other after school setting and so for me I see that as the one of the most powerful things is for the kids to share this enthusiasm and skill that they have with their parents who may be a little bit hesitant to engage with them on it because they don't know you know they don't know how to they don't know how to work that stuff so I, I could see that as a really neat program in a library setting as a real kind of family based art making I think that's a really uh, interesting point and, and, and thing to think about because the perspective that I have and the experiences that I have is that parents want to know, you know, how to use technology in, in ways that are more than just, you know, entertainment. They want to know how to use it to foster learning, but they're just not really sure where to go and, and how to sift through, you know, the apps, for example. And it sounds like what you've got set up kind of provides them with an experience to kind of build some confidence and mm -hmm. that they can have a really rich, meaningful experience with their children and, and creating something and learning technology for themselves, <laughs> learning from their child. Um, so, yeah. Right, and it, it, it also de eliminates that kind of who's supposed to be in charge, Barry, which I yeah. think is kind of a, you know, a battle between the kids. And so the parents, are in a, mm -hmm. the parents end up in the safe space where there's the authority figure there that doesn't have to be them. And yeah. that authority figure can kind of say, you know, what's appropriate and what isn't. Like if a kid wants to do something that's, you know, kind of violent, and the parent might have like a different reaction than an educator, and so the educator can kind of work through that choice with the child in front of the parent, and mm -hmm. that really helps to strengthen you know some of the lessons that the parent might want to teach, but the kid can hear it better from this you know kind of fun educator who's there just to like make sure they have a good time. Yeah. Huh. Intriguing. Uh, Deb, can you talk to us a little bit about the uh, ways, the, the, uh, what you've learned on your journey in, in doing media literacy in the context of the Girls Incorporated project and in terms of your identity as, as a parent? Uh, what, kinds of, what kinds of opportunities might we take on in developing our local or our statewide programs working with the public libraries and the school libraries? Um, sure. I think just to res respond a little bit to what was just talked about um, as a parent and also thinking about how libraries tend to be looked at, um, I think parents identify better with them because they're used to, you know, in their experience, having gone to libraries to do research, do all the things that kids now just sit and do on their computers. And so really engaging the parents in bringing the kids into the libraries, I think, is is a great way to, to work on that angle. Um, I actually, before, I wanted to, what I was thinking about, and this might be jumping ahead a little bit, but in terms of working with um, librarian students, because I'm reflecting on, I, I attended NYU's media education program, it was then called Media Ecology, and I know particularly working with Joellen Fisher Keller, while mostly were, were education students, um, form, you know, future teachers who worked learning media literacy and how to use it in the classroom and what was really beneficial in that experience was connecting the students with local programs or, and or going into schools to do the work that they were doing. I had the double fortune because I was working at Girls Inc. at the time to also be working um, on a Girls Inc. 
program, but also working with some local schools in New York City. So really thinking about how do you engage the librarian students um, with the local programs and also building those commun those networks. Um, and I don't know since how many of the programs there are in the in the area around the school in Providence for them to do that, or even there's a way to connect them um, to do some things online. Mm. Um, I think would be great. Um, thinking about Girls Inc. and the experience I had there, we really did not have much engagement with libraries. It was really working with the local affiliates around the country, um, and but also encouraging them to reach out to their uh, for the resources in their communities. We often re would connect with a local cable access station for them, but I think um, it makes sense to, to work with libraries. I know there's a collaboration here in Columbus that's actually COSI, which is our um, Children's Science Museum, working with the libraries and also um, I believe I, I, there's, not, there's not really a, a, a media, our Children's Media Arts uh, organization that's working with them yet. Um, something I'm thinking about, but um, but sort of thinking about those collaborations and really encouraging um, the libraries to reach out and work with with um, schools as well as with media educators. And and it certainly seems like there might be a link to the nonprofit uh, Boys and Girls Club, Girls Incorporated. That that's another uh, right. opportunity that we can. Explore how those non nonprofit organizations might be enrolled as uh, part of the way we offer services yeah. to libraries. Um, I know I, I, what we some feedback we've gotten right now is that librarians aren't exactly sure where to go yeah. to do uh, to find a film screening, where to go to do a youth media production activity. Um, so a, a big part of this is just sort of filling in the gap. Um, Brian, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, insights you have around making the connection between librarians, parents, early childhood educators, and um, incorporating um, media, uh, media and technology into the um, into the learning formal and le informal learning experiences for children and youth? Um, sure. Um, let's see. I've you know, worked with uh, Erickson in Columbia to kind of co-host a, a conference with our school um, where different educators from different contexts can come together and um, look at how technology and media are, are being used or can be used um, in a classroom context or any really learning context. And we are noticing that more and more librarians are getting interested in, in, in joining that space and actually have a lot to offer. But what we're finding is that you know, there's this disconnect or trying trying to find ways to connect to librarians with schools or, or, or different um, settings. <clears throat> and I think there's an opportunity there for us to provide um, teachers with the opportunity to really realize what library spaces and what librarians and their skill sets have to offer them um, and their classrooms. So that's, that's one thing that I keep thinking about is that kind of... Uh, um, obstacle I guess. Mm -hmm. That uh, is that is the, the idea that teachers may not be so well informed right about yes. how librarians yeah. can be useful to right. them. Yes. Yep. Yep. There I think I don't know if there's just they teachers today still have the traditional idea that you know librarians knowledge is just books you know the, but it's right. so much more vast than this so much larger than that and that you know media the media center isn't just books. There's so many other things, as we've been talking about that, you know, so many different tools or technologies or devices that might be involved in that that are also in classroom context, but can be used in different ways given the different spaces. And I think providing a platform or a venue for, um, uh, you know, teachers and librarians to get together to share their, their perspectives and their skills and their experiences can be powerful for both. Hmm. Hmm. I'm really intrigued about that and that leads us to a question we want to drill down with you on which is we would like to imagine over the course of two years creating a national conference that brings together these three target audiences but to do it in a way that is so not your typical conference right <laughs> we want to do we want to we want an unconference right <laughs> we want to reinvent what the conference experience can be we know that you might, you for instance, who were kind of imagining being some of the talent at the conference, we know that you come to conference in order to 
network with other professionals to share your knowledge and insight or to work on and to to um, tell the story of your own growth and development as as practitioners and as experts um, and to learn from other people what might we do for uh, an unconference where we accomplish those same goals where the experts and the newbies can come together but it, it isn't your typical typical what kind of model should we be thinking about exploring for a national conference well I have an idea but um, <laughs> Can you all hear me? I can't oh, tell. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I haven't thought this through, so I'm just going to say it. We're brainstorming. Um, yeah. So, um, what if it were set up like a production? Um, so, there was a pre production, the actual production and post production component of the conference. So, um, you know, in the pre production phase, people will be coming together to plan out what the actual hands-on activities are going to accomplish um, and maybe it is being filmed by youth like parts of it while while it's happening um, the production phase they're actually you know I, I'm not really sure what I'm saying yet but <laughs> but um, they're actually doing those hands-on activities maybe some of them um, require kind of stepping out of your com comfort zone a little bit so that while they're doing the conference and and gaining an understanding of you know building those networks and gaining an understanding of how they might take this information home they're also understanding a little more about the process if it if it is a combination of libraries and educators and media media leaders then um, you know maybe everyone will leave with a better understanding of how they might go and run a program in their place because of the organization of the conference mm -hmm. It's an idea. I don't know. I think that's a cool idea. Other thoughts? What if you had a conference where you, um, it was like a almost like a petri dish, or you actually were trying to develop programming, and every whatever, every day or every half day, everyone came up with an idea, and then you actually had a big group of kids come in and like try it. You know, maybe it was in a in an, an active library, and it was just like experimentation with actual you know in an actual setting and over the course yeah. of like you know four or five days you could try out you know 10 15 different approaches to, to working yeah and if that had a component with some kind of reflection uh, at the you know a pre a pre something and a post something that could be a powerful learning tool then couldn't it because you'd be experimenting but you'd also be reflecting on what happened in the space. I love yeah. that idea. What else could we consider if we were going to try some break the mold ideas for a conference that brings together uh, children's media professionals, youth media, li school and public librarians, educators, maybe parents, and, and other national experts in this area? Um, with uh, uh, At the National Association for the Education of Young Children conference, we've been trying to figure out ways to get um, these similar audiences together and to have conversations that are meaningful for all you know the agendas that we have uh, for what we want to learn and we have experimented with a variety of frameworks but one that we found successful was we called it a tech play date or something like that and it was a just a large room that was open for probably three or four hours and there were these round tables and each of the round tables had a type of you know a topic or a subject area under the umbrella of technology and young children. Hmm. And there was someone who has special knowledge or experience or expertise in that area, maybe one or two people actually at that table to kind of facilitate a conversation. And it was really informal so that people could come to the table, talk with people who have similar questions. So you're getting, you know, you're getting the novice to the beginners, the beginners and the experience together, just kind of talking. You know, when you go to conferences, we all kind of come with the own, our own questions in our minds of what we're kind of looking for, or what we're looking to learn. And this kind of gave, gave individuals who kind of came in an opportunity to kind of pick and choose where they went to to get that piece of information and then kind of leave. Like, so for example, I was at a table that was, you know, using, um, you know, tools in the classroom context. And one person came up and said, I really want to le learn how to use QR codes. How do I create a QR code? That's what I really want to know. 
So I showed her the two apps, the free apps that she can use. She created a QR code and she was like, all right, all right, great, thanks. That's awesome. I'm ready to go. And then she was able to go off and, you know, use that strategy in the way that she wanted to. Um, so we found that uh, to be successful. I think, you know, having a, you know, if we're going to be talking about different tools or devices, maybe a space where people can kind of sandbox and just kind of play with them. Maybe there's a whiteboard up next to these devices where people can just jot down ideas that they come up with right off the bat that could be, that they could use in their context. Because sometimes, you know, people can look at it, I mean, teachers look at an iPad, they're like, I don't know, what am I going to do with this? But once they get some ideas or given some ideas, you know, then they can kind of go from there. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's that that's is a cool. cool there's a lot of <laughs> that is an absolutely awesome uh, way for us to uh, think a little bit about this. And then I need to get your feedback on um, how we manage to incorporate uh, filmmakers and in the in the independent sector and in the commercial sector uh, and and what your recommendations are for that we've we've definitely got some uh, connections to independent children's filmmakers and we have some connections to the commercial media makers um, the the children's uh, film and television uh, industries in the United States how might we build uh, and a shared knowledge uh, that helps librarians and children's filmmakers in relation to um, parents, educators, and youth media. What what role might you imagine for the filmmakers or the media professionals themselves? Is the knowledge just knowledge of films that they've made, or is it? Are you thinking beyond that? Well, you know, it's it. We don't really know because some some filmmakers can speak more broadly to a range of experiences and, and others can't. So we're trying to figure out, apart from screen the film and tell us how you made it, what other models exist for engaging uh, children's filmmakers uh, with, these, with our other audiences? Well, we have um, filmmakers come in to talk to the youth directly about um, the the different, there are so many career options in the media industry. Um, there's really something for everyone, whether, whether you like to be, you know, a, a techie, a writer, an actor, um, you know, there's so, so many things. So maybe having people talk about it from that perspective of um, skills that lead to careers. Mm, like it. Other ideas? That thank you very much for that. That's a great idea. I think uh, another another thing is to facilitate not just the in person dialogue, but the you know online dialogue. One of the things that's been really powerful, having been you know working with youth and media for almost twenty years now, and one of the big changes is that the students are not there's it's so much easier for the students to be in touch with the filmmakers, and what I found is that seems to make the idea of becoming a filmmaker seem even more possible for them because mm -hmm. You know, you can instantly email a filmmaker and say, how did you do this? Or I'm making a film myself and I wanted to know how you got this effect. Right. And then that works with teens, but, uh, you know, kids are six, seven, eight-year-olds are making films now too. So if there's a way for them to, you know, know how to connect with that filmmaker and ask them a question, whether it's about content or about, you know, some kind of filmmaking issue, that might be a, a fun way to, to engage. I love that idea. Other ideas? How could we inv involve the media professionals? Think of the media professionals you know and work with and think about what they, how they might uh, contribute to our building, getting people out of their silos and strengthening people's capacity for collaboration. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about um, Tiffany Slane, who was at the, the, the conference and wondering how her, her format of crowd filmmaking could could be incorporated where she actually puts out a question and gets video clips from around the world and then puts them together into a film. If there's some way to use that type of model of collaborative filmmaking um, as part of the the event or a pre either pre event mm -hmm. or part of the event. Oh, and for librarians, wouldn't that be a powerful uh, tool to increase their own confidence? Right, that um, they just contributed a tiny little. A 20-second bit 
but it's strong, mm -hmm. got it's strung cool. together with a lot of other uh, pieces and made uh, something you know coherent and beautiful. Mm -hmm. Cool idea. Yeah. Um, other ideas on this conference, out of the box thinking about conferences? All right, let's turn to this challenging issue of um, what, how to help library students get more deep dive experience in uh, children's media, youth media, media literacy, and, and connecting to um, teachers uh, around um, connecting, you know, print literacy to film literacy to media literacy to visual literacy and all the rest. If you had a library student for um, four weeks and think about how this you might encounter this person online or you might encounter this person face to face, what might be possible uh, in terms of experiential learning for a library graduate student to be able to do or accomplish if they had the chance to hang out with you for a bit or if they had the chance to get some experiential learning in, 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 a, in a variety of school or public or uh, nonprofit or youth media settings. What could they do? What should they do? Um, I can speak to my undergraduate experience though in learning to be a teacher and we have what was called the professional development school and in part of the program our actual uh, you know college classes were held in an elementary school so the class was there and we were learning about you know the content and the strategies and then we were all divided into classrooms so we would go out into the classrooms and we would try the strategy out and then we would come back together and reflect so for a half a morning we were actually in the school you know literally had the laboratory at our fingertips <clears throat> to work in it wasn't you know on campus you you know go off and try it once and come back you know this it was just constant connection you know um, which made for a really powerful um, experience and um, I thought it was really interesting I love that Coach. idea that idea was born in Chicago so uh, to export that to Rhode Island that'd be my dream come true yeah. <laughs> other ideas what would you do if you had a library student let's say online or face to face they could give you six or eight hours a week what what could what could they do with you how could they learn from you what could they how might such learning be organized it's funny when I think library I think like our library and archiving and categorizing which is probably such an outdated idea of what a like like a librarian would be able to do but I feel like understanding how your work is you know searchable how it's categorizable how it's you know how you can get it out to other people like that's something that I think we all don't do well is how mm -hmm. to you know we make all this stuff but then we don't we don't really besides send it to the you know the youth film festivals that's about it um, so for us, learning from someone who has a better uh, understanding of how to make things searchable, findable, and you know easily accessible by someone who's looking for a topic would be helpful. That's a great idea. Great. It's selfish. I need that help. No, no, but, that's, but that actually taps into where their expertise is and how the where the synergy is between the things they know how to do and the things you know how to do. So that's that's a win-win. I love that idea. How else could library students be helpful to you, and 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 how might you help their skills and knowledge develop? Well, I don't know. I mean, how much do library students um, get trained in like youth youth work, youth development issues, and stuff, and that type of education? Because I think that's something that we all, as educators, bring. And that's what I find in a museum setting as well. It's like people in a museum setting don't know much about youth development. So that's been a lot of what my work has been here is to did that kind of training. And I think right. in a library setting, you might, you know, that might be very helpful for us to be able to give that type of, um, you know, how to how to work with youth at various stages in their in their education development. I love it. So that's something that if we could add to the curriculum, might increase their ability to be effective yeah. at, at, in running programs, in managing programs, in initiating programs. Thanks for not, sharing that. Anything not just else for the individuals. Should know? 
not not yeah. just for the individuals, but also for the, the institutions themselves. I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar with how much libraries are, how much training goes into library staff around the youth development. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm totally ignorant in that. Yeah, I would say that um, in our experience, that's another thing that sets our program apart from libraries is that, you know, our, our educators are educated in youth development also, so there's there's a real mentorship component to our program. Um, that's really hard to, to transfer to the library when we're not there. Um, but another idea, I'm not sure if it's as in line with, with what you're asking, but um, a lot of libraries have tutoring programs and a way for them to kind of hit on multiple goals is to think about their tutoring programs differently using media as, you know, a really fun and engaging way for students who are struggling with a certain subject matter ah. to create projects around around that learning. We've done um, pretty much in every, you know, some subjects lend themselves to it more than others, but we've done school residencies where, you know, we've, we've even had um, a lot of math videos created where kids are using their own bodies to show rotation and other other math um, yeah. words. <laughs> so so there's I think a way to approach tutoring using using media doing um, you know mini documentaries or um, media kind of visual visual docs instead of written or um, I'm sorry uh, visual reports. Right. Instead right. of things like that, public service announcements. I I love that idea, and I I feel like that kind of leads us to our last question before we let you go. We we know that one of the opportunities that and the challenges of uh, grant writing like this is addressing the issue of how these programs are sustained once the grant is completed. Because what we really want to do is use this grant to build capacity here in Rhode Island to fertilize the community with the national experts and the kinds of uh, deep experiences that many of you have had working in this field for uh, years and years. Um, but we also know that when the grant runs out, we want to be able, we want those programs, we want the capacity to be able to continue to advance. So what insight do you have on how we write this grant and develop this project in a way that it is sustainable when the um, the funding has run out. What's your what insight have you gained from your experiences that can help help us uh, take away some lessons that we can incorporate into our, our our planning? I'm gonna throw out just a quick story from Boston because there's this group called the Record Company and they're brand new. They're a new nonprofit and they have like this prof very professional recording studio and expertise and and the guy is a Berkeley Youth School of Music graduate and he had done a kind of a tour of a lot of different places in Boston they might have been libraries a lot of them were after school settings and he realized that they had so much equipment so much audio recording equipment but no expertise in how to use it but the problem with him being so new is that he couldn't get grants to be the <laughs> content provider so there was a really neat there's a really neat uh, moment here where these guys really want to be the content providers. They are committed to having this nonprofit in the community. All these institutions, all these libraries, all these schools are committed to having these labs, but they can't necessarily maintain the staff. So somehow <laughs> thinking about finding those pairings between, you know, what is available in the library, finding the people who are passionate about it. Both, I mean, they're experts too. I mean, they're they do professional recording and they want to do youth stuff as well. So how can you find those people who? will almost take over the grant writing part of it after once they've gotten their you know gotten their bearings or you know you can get people who have already been doing it but you also can find these people who are just trying to start up and just might not have that track record yet to get that grant funding. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a great point. Thank you for thank you for sharing that. I do think that Providence is full of uh, young people like that who are looking for those kind of on-ramp opportunities as part of their own creative work and as part of their community service and sense of social justice. Uh, so I do think that that idea of a pair, the way these programs might have a partnership that develops over time to help 
um, build capacity. That's a cool idea. Any other thoughts on this issue of how do we sustain, how do we create something that can be sustainable? Sure. I just thinking of our experience at Girls Inc. where we were piloting our program at eight affiliates across the country and you know once the grant was over, once the program was in their hands and they had training, um, it was on their, it was on them to keep it going. And so what we did is build into the curriculum um, fundraising assistance, you know, ways, thoughts about how to fundraise, who to fundraise, um, mm -hmm. standard grant proposals around the program mm -hmm. um, so that they had the resources to then um, take over and do their own fundraising to keep it going. Cool. That's helpful. And that's something we'd want to do through the university once we bring these folks together as, as part of our mission is to use that uh, convening and uh, sharing uh, uh, mm -hmm. capacity, uh, you know, after the grant is over. Any other thoughts on how we manage to sustain uh, a, a momentum after in a post-grant environment? Many of you have had experience with that, and I, I, I know that we've had our successes and we've also had our failures. So maybe you can also help us what to do and what not to do. I mean, just to piggyback off of the, you know, the fundraising. Um, teens or whatever at being working at an independent school we have a you know an advancement or you know team that is their one single charge is fundraising mm -hmm. and coming up with creative ways to to try and, and get some, some financial support so whether it's special events you know where individuals might want to you know um, uh, uh, donate or you know maybe there's a paddle raise or something that are big initiative new initiative we have for the year or you know there's ways where we're showcasing you know all the progress that was made and all the learning all the rich experiences you know that have been had over the previous year um, or um, just trying to think <clears throat> off the top of my head I guess it's I think that's what's been most successful for us is just kind of having these events where we get you know, families and people together and kind of really kind of develop an energy that kind of inspires people to want to give and help and want to be part of that process of sustaining the program. Right, right. right. I, I like the idea. I mean, I think one of the reasons why we're, we're, we're working on this project so diligently is we sense that um, librarians really do want to partner uh, with other community partners to um, bring these competencies to their communities. Uh, it's just a question of practice in collaboration, right? And uh, you know, getting your feet wet on collaboration. That that um, these are not groups who have engaged in a lot of um, collaboration across sectors. So maybe just that process is going to create some deepening relationships that can the relationships get sustained over time. All right. Well, I think in I have of, one more point. Wait, um, on that, um, which is because our program is set up so differently than the libraries, we work with youth very intensively over sometimes years. We wind up with this um, body of youth that is about to age out of our program that has, you know, really advanced skills. And so we've been pairing them with the librarians um, to keep costs down, to give them work experience. So our advanced youth are going to the, the Homago sessions to support teens that are kind of new to the different tools that, that the library have. And um, it's a win-win for all of us. I love that example. And you know what's so beautiful about that is, like you said, that is a win-win for the kid, or for the young adult. Right? That's right. And for us, we're, we're getting them some professional experience, which is great because that's one of our goals. Nice. Oh, that's a beautiful example. I think we'll, we will uh, think about how we can do that. We, what we need is a robust youth media organization uh, that can provide that more intensive training that libraries probably aren't well equipped to do, but but uh, but uh, organization like you are. So maybe when you come join us in Providence, you'll help inspire uh, whoever's going to be our partner for that. Great. <laughs> and obviously, what I'm hoping to uh, hoping to do is imagine how you might uh, help us think about um, what role you can play in fertilizing uh, the ground here in Rhode Island and. Um, so I, 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 I guess I'd invite you to do two things. If, if you can imagine, um, we'll find out in October uh, if we get this grant, and if we do, we're going to 
quick like a bunny tried to bring together some of our national advisory board members to help us with the 2015 conference in February so I'd like you to be thinking about if you could um, you know if, if we had resources and funds to support your participation at that conference what might you want to do share showcase um, and then the other thing I'd like to invite you to do is help us by uh, sharing what comes across your email uh, inbox um, stuff that you stumble upon that you think oh this might be useful for them because um, uh, uh, Katie and I are in a deep dive learning on this topic ourselves and it's very likely that you're running across resources and ideas and materials that uh, could be really helpful to our thinking so uh, I hope that you uh, will continue to share and forward those uh, materials uh, with us for the next couple of months as we as we work on this project at this point we have time if you have any questions that you want to ask each other or ask us that's this is an opportunity for that I was wondering is it possible to kind of like get a list or of who el who's all on this board outside of this conversation so we can kind of see you know who else is you know working on this and who else we can get connected with I think that would be great absolutely absolutely we're just putting together that web page by we should have that by the weekend uh, oh. which is kind of going to be a, a, a a little blurbs about you, how to get a hold of you, because we do see you being resources to each other in really exciting ways. That's that's we're kind of jump starting the networking. We knew you all wanted to meet each other, and uh, when you see the whole list of advisors, you'll be pretty impressed. And I think we are really proud of uh, of the work you're doing, and we're just delighted that you're agreed to help us. But we'll definitely forward you that information so you can learn about each other. Other questions, comments. Advice? I have a question about the um, that ten day children's film festival. Yes. That's not um, films no. made by youth. That's films no. targeting youth, correct? It's it's films targeting youth, and there is a very small uh, program of youth made media, okay. and we're in conversation with them about expanding that as a strand within the uh, festival. But the festival is curated by a children's media professional who, who selects films for children, almost always made by adults, made by uh, media professionals. Do you think there's a, there's a, a need for a, a, a youth media uh, sc a screening to be expanded as part of this uh, event? And if so, why? Well, I think as as the initiative grows, being that one of the goals is to get youth making media, it would be great to you know to have their their work exhibited, give them a chance for recognition. Do you think there's a need for another kind of competition? Because there are a lot of competitions. The White House has got one going on right now. <laughs> I it, have one. <laughs> would it be useful for us to uh, to host a competition? Or well, no? Are there too many of those already? I I don't think there's too many. I think it's, you know, the more opportunities we have to showcase youth media and a youth voice, the better. Yeah, if you can gather an audience, I mean, whether it's competitive or not, I think if you can gather an audience for a group of youth films, it's that's great. You know, and, and I think there are, you know, I'm biased having run one and now submitting to them. I, I, I There are yeah. ways that I like it run and there are ways I don't like them run. Um, but anytime you can, in a healthy, positive way, bring people to see youth work and bring those youth there to experience an audience seeing their work, there can't be enough of that. That's a great point. Other comments or questions? All right. Well, we are really grateful for you uh, spending time with us uh, to get us our fertilize our our thinking and to uh, to brainstorm with us. We're going to keep you in the loop all the way through this process. We're going to share with you the grant that we submit, and we're going to uh, let you know whether we get it or not. <laughs> so you'll be you'll be. Um, following our journey as we uh, try to make this Media Smart Libraries thing a go and um, we're really grateful that you were able to join us today we're hoping fingers crossed we pull it together enough for us to um, you know 
continue to play in this sandbox and grow and learn from each other. Thanks very much for uh, spending time with us, and um, we'll see you later. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.